Good morning. So it's fitting that uh, Chase read the scripture this morning when uh, Jimmy asked me to speak about a week and a half ago when I was trying to decide what I was going to speak on. I asked Chase what would be a good idea, and he mentioned this subject. And he didn't really expand upon why. Um, perhaps it was because somebody brought up this idea from, from school, it could be. And that got me thinking that... Um, one of the lone memories I have from uh, growing up in, in Missouri before we moved to a smaller town was in the mid-80s, I was, at, I was uh, with one of my friends in the area, and, and somehow the, the subject came up. I, I don't remember how or why. And his thought was that when the day of judgment comes, that when you go and you meet God and you tell your story, you petition him, and he says all the things that you've done in your life, that you haven't followed the Lord, that I'm sorry, you're going to have to go down instead of up. His thought was, but if you just have a meek heart and you say, I'm really sorry for what I did, I didn't mean it. God, being such a good God, will raise us up into the clouds with him. That's what he thought. So that was one of the first times I'd ever heard the phrase rapture, because it's not something that I had ever heard uh, mentioned or even preached about growing up. And Chase's uh, um, scripture that he just read certainly talks a little bit about um, what's going to happen uh, those days. Um, this morning, I'm not going to talk about the full extent, because then we'll be here for half the day, right? So I'm not going to talk about Armageddon. I'm not going to talk about Judgment Day, Limbo, Doomsday, Shoal, uh, Hades, Paradise, Leviathan, or I'm not going to talk about the thousand-year reign. I'm not going to get into all those subjects. I just want us to ponder two questions this morning. When... Will that happen? And what will happen that day, that day of judgment? The definition of the rapture is the transporting of believers to heaven at the second coming of Christ. And then a further definition that Webster's has is an, bless you, eschatological, which means the study of death, Theological position held by some Christians, particularly within branches of American evangel evangelicalism, consisting of an end-time event when all Christian believers who, al who are alive, along with resurrected believers, would rise in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Kind of makes sense. I, th I think that's what we understand that the rapture means. And when we think about the end of days, the end of time, there's been a lot of events that we can think of when maybe it is going to be the end of time. I'm sure people with the COVID pandemic thought this might be the beginning of the end because everybody for a few months back in 2020 or some people longer didn't leave their homes. They were afraid to go out and live. Um, I think about in my lifetime also 9-11. You know, what happened with in New York, what happened not too far from here, what happened at the Pentagon. Maybe a lot of people thought that was the end of time. I also thought something else that Chase brought up within the last couple weeks was Nagasaki and Hiroshima. What do people in Japan think when the atomic bombs fell on those villages. Did they think it was the end of time as well? Um, the Holocaust, right? How many Jews thought, oh, this has got to be the end after the way we're being treated by Hitler and the Nazis. They probably th thought the world was ending. Um, maybe world wars, the Civil War, maybe people thought was the end. All the way back to the time of even the flood before Christ, maybe people thought the world is ending with the waters that came upon the earth. 
So I went into Wikipedia because because that's my source, I guess, sometimes to look up information. And there's a list of of, of dates predicted for apocalyptic events. And there's probably, there's over a hundred, but I wanted to read some of these because it's interesting what influenced people to, to have these predictions. The very first one that this article shows is in 66 to 70 AD is the first one. And, um, the Jewish uprising against the Romans in Judea, people saw as the final end-time battle, which would bring about the arrival of the Messiah. By the authority of Simon, coins were minted, were minted declaring the redemption of Israel. So this is just 30, 35 years after the death of Jesus, people thought the world was ending. Okay, and we'll, we'll develop into some of that here in a little bit. Um, another one was 500 AD. Um, there were three people that predicted Jesus would return in this year based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Okay? So based on the length and width of the Ark, they determined that 500 AD, that would be the end. Um, the first date exactly was April 6, 793. A Spanish monk prophesied the second coming of Christ and the end of the world on that day in front of a large crowd of people. So how did that monk feel when that didn't happen and it was April 7th, 793? Okay. But, but there's some even better ones, so just bear with me. 1847, a Christian named Theoda declared that the world would end that year. He, although later he, he confessed that his prediction was fraudulent and was publicly flogged. Good for Theoda. Uh, there was a Catholic pope that decreed in 1284 the world would end because that was 666 years after the rise of Islam. Okay, so using some numbers to... To base his prophecy, he was wrong, of course. 1346 through 1351, that was the period of the Black Death across Europe. They thought that was the end of times. Um, February 1st, 1524, a group of astrologers, so it says astrologers, in London predicted the world would end by a flood starting in London Based on calculations, 20,000 Londoners left their homes and headed for higher ground in anticipation. We've heard other things like that recently, too. 1525, Thomas Munster um, thought that this year would mark the beginning of the millennium. Well, his followers were killed by cannon fire in an uneven battle with government troops. He died under torture and was beheaded. 1533, a prophet claimed that 144,000 people would be saved. 144,000, I think we've heard that term before, that only there was a set number of people that would be saved. Um, 1585, there was a reformer who claimed that the devil's reign in this world had started in 325 A.D. and would last for 1,260 years, ending in 1585. Um, that's a unique one, I guess. Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus in 1658 claimed that the world was created in, five, in 5,343 B.C., it would last 7,000 years. That means the world would end in 1658. That was Christopher Columbus. Uh, the fifth moniker, man, monikerists in 1666, based on the presence of the 666 in the date and the death of 100,000 
Europeaners to bubonic plague thought the world was ending. Okay. There, oh, there's more. And I think there's a lot more that's not even in here. There was a mathematician on April 5th, 1719, that predicted a comet would destroy the earth. In 1736, another theologian predicted a comet would co collide with the earth that year. In 1793, Richard Brothers, who is a retired sailor, stated the millennium would begin between 1793 and 1795. <laughs> when that didn't happen, he was eventually committed to an, to an insane asylum. In 1806, in Leeds, England, a hen began laying eggs on which the phrase, Christ is coming, was written. Surprisingly, it was discovered to be a hoax. No way. The owner, Mary Batesman, had written on the eggs in a corrosive ink so as to etch the eggs and reinserted the eggs back into the hen's oviduct. Okay, that's, a, that's an interesting one. Oh, 1874, jo Jonas Wendell published his views in the booklet entitled The Present Truth, um, concluding that the second advent was sure to occur in 1873. After the prediction did not bear out, Nelson Bardor reinterpreted the prediction, holding that Jesus had in fact returned in 1874, but in invisible form. So he came back, but he was invisible. Yeah, good one. Uh, the Catholic Church, uh, Catholic Apo Apostolic Church, which was founded in 1831, claimed that Jesus would return by the time the last of its 12 founding members died. Well, the last member died in 1901. That didn't happen. Uh, let's see. Oh, this one. September 1935. Wilbur Glenn Voliva announced that the world is going to go poof and disappear in September 1935. Good one, Wilbur. 1936, Herbert W. Armstrong. He was a founding member of the Worldwide Church of God, told members of his church that the rapture was to take place in 1936 and that only they would be saved. After that prophecy failed, he would change it again three more times. So if you get it wrong once, just keep trying, right? Maybe you'll be right. Uh, let's see, David Berg in January 1974 predicted that there would be a doomsday event caused by a comet. 1976, Brahma Kumaris, which um, was a sect of Islam, thought in that year only those, the group within that sect, would be purified. All the rest of humanity would be killed by nuclear or civil wars, which will include sinking of all other continents except India. There's so many of these guys. It's, I'm skipping over a lot. Uh, April 29, 1986, Halley's Comet. Would, de would destroy the earth. August 17th, 1987, again, the 144,000 people number that Armageddon would take place unless all these people gathered in certain places across the world in order to resonate in harmony on this day. So I guess that happened. Everybody lined up where they should, and Armageddon didn't happen. Okay, that was another one. Harold Camping did five predictions. Um, there was a sect that predicted in 1994 New York City would be destroyed by a nuclear bomb and the Battle of Armageddon would take place 40 days later. Um, let's see. And we also think about the ones, that this will sound familiar because we've heard other stories of this. March 26, 1997, 
Marshall Applewhite claimed that a spacecraft was traveling to the comet Bell Hillbop and argued that suicide was the only way to evacuate this Earth. So Applewhite and 38 of his followers committed mass suicide. So unfortunately, we've heard of those a couple times. Um, how about this one? January 1st, 2000. How many people do you think predicted the end of the world? It's got about 10 on here. One of them was Jerry Falwell, actually. Some of you may recognize that name. He predicted that God would make judgment on the world on that day. And so there's a lot in here, of course, about Y2K. Those of us that were old enough to go through that time, a lot of people thought the world was ending because computers couldn't function, right? They didn't, they didn't know how to change from 1999 to 2000. Uh, let's see, there was some, in, oh, in 2003, Nancy Leader claimed that aliens in the Zeta Reticuli star system would enter the solar system and cause a pole shift on Earth that would destroy most of humanity. And Harold Camping was another one who did five predictions. Apparently, people still followed him to think that the fifth one would come true. The first four did, didn't show anything. Uh, there's the blood moon prophecy, and there are others. But the latest one that, that some of you might have heard were the Daybells. That was that Idaho couple that uh, their, you know, Stacy remembers because we watched a couple uh, criminal shows on that. That was a couple that they killed each other's spouses and their kids, and then they got married, and predicted that July 22nd, 2020 was going to be the end of the world, and the reason they killed their kids and their spouses was because they were zombies, right? Zombies had inhabited them. Uh, the wife told the husband that she believed she was sent from God and would assist God with Christ's second coming. So how did she feel on July 23rd, 2020, is my question. So, and, and that's just a few that I, I read through. Not all involve aliens or spacecrafts, but a lot of them involve numbers and astrology and things like that. But there's one thing that I've always thought when we've heard somebody give out a specific date on when the world would end. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've always thought, that's absolutely not the day the, the world would end. That's the way I, I feel like God would not let the world end on that date just for somebody to be proven correct. At least that's what I think. So, yeah, some interesting ones there. So when, when, when will the world end, right? All right, we're going to be here quite a long time. It didn't end in 1979, but 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2 says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So again, like I said, all those dates that I read, that's probably not when the world's going to end, right? Um, but it's interesting that one of the first dates that I read was A.D. 70, or 66, said 66 to 70, somewhere in that range. Again, that was 30 years after Christ uh, died on the cross. And so I think of 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1 and 2 I'll read. It says, but understand this, that in the last days, the New King James says perilous days, there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, and on and on through verse 9. So, thanks Bella. So people have been that way since the writing in Timothy. People at that time thought the world was going to end really soon so 
Do we know? Can we figure out by numbers or astrology or really delve into God's word and figure out a date? No, because it says the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. We don't know when. So the next question is, what will happen? So a little bit from what Chase read was in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And the part I always think about with the sound of the trumpet of God. There have been a few instances, and I can't remember specifically where I was. And I know one time we were, we were it was a few years ago back in Iowa, and it was the middle of the day. And I think maybe I had the TV on, and I just heard a trumpet blaring. And that thought went through my head. Oh, is that the end? Is this it? So there have been times when I've, when I've heard a trumpet that, that, that it's made me think of, think of it. So this scripture that, that we read earlier talks about those that died, that believe that Jesus died and rose again, um, they will be, um, the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. So that's part of the what. But the question is, what about those who are not in Christ? So I, I, I hearken back to my buddy's story that was... Even though he wasn't in Christ, if he just asked for forgiveness on the day of judgment, you know, God is good. He's a loving God. He wouldn't let anyone perish, right? So he's going to have us have him jo join the saints in heaven. Well, and then we have this scripture in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that might just conflict with that. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. This evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well to us when the Lord Jesus listen to this next part. Those who you might think about what my buddy said all those many years ago. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. That's pretty heavy. That doesn't really sound like uh, what my friend thought many years ago. It says in verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our Lord, the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I read this passage, it makes me think of um, one of the things that was mentioned this morning in class was fear God and keep his commandments. This is fear. Because this is what the alternative could be on that day of judgment. Look at those words. Verse 8, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance. So again, yes, God is a loving God. If, the, if he loved us so much, why would he send us to death? Why would he flood the earth? 
And it's because God detests, he hates wickedness, weakness. He sent his own son to die on the cross to give us that avenue of mercy and grace from our sins, our mistakes, to follow him. But we have to follow him to show that least bit of worthiness. Are, are we worthy by ourselves? No. But if we follow him, if we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, then we can become worthy. You can't just say you're sorry on the day of judgment and all will be forgiven. Right? If we believe what's in the scriptures, that can't be true that we can just say, hey, I'm sorry. Can I come up there with you? So what do we do? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, so all of this end of time discussion, 1 and 2 Thessalonians has a lot of good, a lot of good scriptures to read through. I, I would stress to you, if you guys have time later today or this week, read through some of it. It's, it's very good. If you've ever wondered, um, about Judgment Day and wh what's going to happen and, and where our minds and our hearts should be. I'm just going to read a, a little bit of this. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I already read verse 2, but I'm going to start in verse 1. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying... There is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And then there's more to that passage that is pretty good, but I just want to stop there. It says, let us keep awake and be sober. So again, I, I think back to class and I was smiling because Brent was kind of thinking along what I was, is that we need to be ready because we don't know what the future holds. Now, does that mean that, that I'm saying future, okay, so maybe the world will end today? It could. That's a possibility. Despite what Dave thinks, maybe this will be the storm of the century and wipe us out. I doubt it. But the other thing is we also don't know how long we're going to live. Right? Um, we hear all the time about cancer, sudden illness, accidents, tragedies that happen. What this is telling us is to be ready. To don't go into periods of depression or just rebellion and do things you know that aren't right and just think, well, I'll make myself right in the future. What if there is no future? What if there is no tomorrow? Maybe not for all of us, but maybe for me, maybe for you. For God has de not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not destined for us. There aren't 144,000 people that preordained that are going to be with God in heaven. And they can just do whatever we want. No matter what we do, we're not worthy. Right? We have free will. We have the opportunity to decide to dedicate our lives to the Lord. So the last thing I want to leave with you before I close is a song in our song books. It's number 727. And it's titled, Jesus is Coming Soon. By the way, it was written in 1942. So that was before the bombing of the two cities in Japan. I guess that was in the middle of what, you, what would be the Holocaust, right? But it was written in 1942. And it starts off, Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. And then the chorus goes, Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many 
will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All of the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies. Heaven we're bound. I think that's a fitting song to think about this morning. So in closing, we don't know when the rapture, judgment day, the end of days will happen. But we have been told what will happen. John tells us in Revelation of the beauty in heaven. And what we just read in 2 Thessalonians tells us some of the horrors of hell. Flaming fire taking vengeance on those who are not with the Lord. Again, verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, But let us keep awake and be sober. Be ready. It's a responsibility that we all have if we want to be with our Lord after the judgment day. The first step we all must do is put Christ on in baptism. Step two is to live your life the best Christian way that you can, but know that it won't be easy, that we're going to have struggles, trials. It's not going to be all roses, right? Easy, easy time. So that's the lesson I'll leave you with this morning. If there's anyone this morning who has not accepted the gospel call to be admitted into the fold, we offer you that chance now to come forward, confess your faith, repent of your sins, and be baptized. There's water in our baptistry. Um, we invite you to come forward. If anyone here this morning needs prayers of the congregation because there is something stressful on your heart, or maybe you've, you've slipped away, whatever your need is, we're here to work together. We're here to support each other as a church, as a congregation. Whatever your need might be, please come forward as we stand and sing.